thank you. Sorry. I was thanking you for having me back. I have no idea if you heard that or not. <laughs> I'm going to share some slides with you today that look at what we consider a dementia-friendly community. I hope that you can learn a little bit about dementia today. I hope that you can think as a church, as a congregation, as a group, how you can be dementia-friendly here. And I hope that, uh, don't worry, I have the question sheet. I've already been primed with some questions. I will do my best to answer those questions for you. And I hope that you will then choose to ask some questions yourself if I haven't covered it over in the talk. The reason that I um, come back to talk is, is that I had a very kind invitation from Gareth and I do appreciate that very much. But the reason that I've come back to talk is that I barely scratched the surface last time. And this is not actually going to complete everything. What I hope to do is plant some seeds today. I should have all brought you forget-me-not seed. I want to plant some seeds so that if you decide to take any of this information further, uh, if, if you decide that's a good thing, Gareth can be in touch with me and I can give you uh, further information that you can delve into as it suits you as, as a congregation. So what we want to do today is sort of help you understand dementia as, as a lived experience, some of the common signs, some strategies for interaction, how you might want to go further, further in life. So. Just a couple of facts. Really, this, these numbers are gonna reinforce the importance of learning about dementia and learning how we can reduce stigma because there is a horrific amount of stigma when it comes to dementia. Look at this right now. Now in Ontario, this is Can Canadian up there, 600,000 Canadians right now. In Ontario, it's 300,000 people right now living with dementia. And if you want to get local, there's 16,500 people. Those are diagnosed cases. We're going to have almost 2 million people by the time we blink in the year 2050. Note the 28,000, note the 28,000 people under the age. You know what, can I take this off? Yeah. We're going to, we're going to do this a different way folks. Just pull. The heck with the notes. I'm just going to come over here. I'm going to be able to see and talk to you at the same time. And I'll just holler next if that's okay. Each and every time. So look at the last stat. That's almost half the people who don't want to share that they are experiencing dementia. That's kind of a terrifying thing because how do we support people if they don't want to talk about dementia? And so we want to reduce stigma. I'm going to show you a quick film. It's a very short film. It's, it's under four minutes. And I want you, as you watch this film, to be thinking about how would you know somebody has dementia and what can we do? Could you, 
So when you watched that, what jumped out at you? What struck you as you watched that little film clip? How scary it was. It was scary? Sorry, I don't know your names, I'll have to point. I know it's rude, but. Um, I think what she did was make a hot cup of coffee and put it in the fridge. Sure, she put the, the milk in the cupboard and the tea in the fridge. Yep, back, backwards. Somebody said frustrated, I'll get to you in a sec. It must be terrifying to live that way. It can be terrifying to live that way. Well, what this stood out to me was how, how um, annoyed everybody seemed. How annoyed everybody seemed. No one listened. Yeah. Nobody listened. Noisy and chaotic. Noisy and chaotic, glad you picked everybody up on that. Seemed to be encouraged. What about a hurry? Everybody seemed to be Yeah, everybody seemed to be in a hurry. I'm not ignoring this side of the room. Did they take all your good answers <laughs> <laughs> at the back? Yeah, I did. Even just how like the self-serve nature of things uh, complicates things. Like you go to an ATM mm -hmm. as opposed to having somebody available to help you. Yep, yep. Anything else you want to point out or struck you? This one might be a little difficult, but you might have noticed the field of vision did not seem wide and whole. Very tunnel vision. All right. Well, Blurry. Blurry, yep, and the noise was should have been a little overwhelming for you. So Adam, if you don't mind just finishing it off. People with dementia have experiences like this every day. A little bit of understanding, tolerance, and patience can make all the difference. Uh, I'll tell you what, if you call me to the seats just there, right. when we get there, I'll call you, okay? It's okay, Madam. She received assistance and she had somebody literally lead her and show her where to find what it was she needed. Those may seem like tiny things, those are huge because those were three insurmountable object or obstacles for her without the help. This woman is named Mary Beth, Mary Beth Whiten. And I've had the privilege of, of knowing and working with Mary Beth Whiten. And what I'm going to do is just read you very briefly an excerpt that Mary Beth wrote. Um, my diagnosis was six years ago. And what you might find interesting about my reaction to hearing the news is that I was actually relieved. This might sound odd, but the fact is for two years prior to my diagnosis, I knew something was wrong. I saw many doctors and was prescribed many types of medication. So when I finally received the diagnosis of probable frontal temporal dementia, I was like, oh, okay, now we know. And now I can fight this thing. As for the reactions of the people around me, it was basically shock. Predictably, I suppose, they all said I was too young and there must be a mistake. So when I showed you the film a moment ago and we had a white haired woman trying to navigate around, probably didn't surprise anybody. When I show you Mary Beth, still had a teenager at home, young teenager at home when I was working with her, they all told me to get another opinion. And this is one of the most misunderstood elements of dementia. The idea is that it's just old people who get it. The disease is so misunderstood that even medical professionals sometimes don't know how to handle it. I have this disease. There is no cure. It will continue to get worse. 
The average life expectancy is six to eight years. The first doctor that gave me the diagnosis certainly lacked compassion and was pretty matter of fact about it. He told me to go home and get my affairs in order. And then the doctor said, I need to take your driver's license away immediately. That doesn't always happen, but it certainly happened to Mary Beth. And I think it's the fear of that that keeps people from seeking professional medical help. Stigma is one of the biggest hurdles we face, and it comes in many forms. There are the non-believers who think I'm faking it. I am a caregiver for my parents. My dad, it is my dad's 91st birthday today. In case, yay, dad. He's 91 today. He's been living with dementia for about eight years now. And my mom is 92 and she has her own journey. And people say to me all the time, no, your dad looks fabulous. Darn right, he looks fabulous. Do you know what we go through to make sure he looks fabulous? <laughs> Same with my mom. Nobody's gonna believe she's 92. Of course not. There are three kids working every single day as a team to keep them looking great. It doesn't mean they don't have dementia. It is such an invisible disability. So please do not let your expectations based on appearance guide your expectations of ability. Mary Beth goes on to say, people view me as lazy because she looks young, she looks strong, and she looks healthy. People see you as if you are in the end stage. So we have the people who don't believe her and the people who treat her as if she's umpteen years further into the journey than she is. There is so much living to be done prior to the end, yet people put me in that end stage. When we're talking about dementia, we're not talking about a single disease. Dementia is a syndrome, a collection of symptoms, and those symptoms accompany many diseases. It's going to show you the most common type of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. Then vascular dementia accounts for about 20% of the cases. Lewy body dementia looks like a cross between Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, comes in at five to 15 cases. And the more rare, but one that tends to strike younger, are FTDs or frontotemporal dementias. It doesn't matter what type of dementia somebody has, the Alzheimer's Society is the place to go, any type of dementia. And there are many, many times you will never know what type of dementia somebody has. Please don't let not knowing what type of dementia they have preclude you from simply meeting them where they are in that moment. Whether somebody has Alzheimer's or whether somebody has vascular disease, what we need to contend with on a day-to-day -day basis is what is their functionality, how can we fill in for the gaps, and how can we support their remaining strengths? You know, I brought up a few minutes ago the idea that sometimes people are really scared to go to the doctor, and I hear all the time, they think they'll immediately be either have a license removed or be told they have to move into a home. That is a myth, but it is, it is out there in the community. The reason it's important to consider going to a doctor is on this slide right here. There are things that mimic dementia, that make you look like you have dementia when you don't. You could have undiagnosed depression. You could have side effects from a medication, an interaction of medications, a new medication, a toxic buildup of meds, who knows. Vision and hearing, I cannot encourage you enough to come and hear Shirley Monk. When Shirley comes, there is a huge body of research that relates hearing loss with increased risk of dementia. Come and hear. But vision and hearing impairments that are often left untreated because if it occurs slowly over time, people just become used to their new normal. Nutritional deficiencies, that can be bad diet, that can be lack of B vitamins, uh, that can actually be issues where you're constipated or you're dehydrated. Delirium, if you have another sort of infection in your body, if you have um, a urinary tract infection or an oral infection or a chest infection, 
you can develop a delirium, which is uh, a sudden change in your cognitive abilities, but it's due to infection. Metabolic disorders, maybe you have undiagnosed thyroid disease, maybe you have undiagnosed diabetes, heaven forbid you have undiagnosed limp, um, Lyme's disease, or sleep disorders. Sleep is not a luxury. Sleep is a necessity. You probably are well, well aware the Geneva Convention says that sleep deprivation is a torture that is no longer an acceptable thing to do to people. We do it to ourselves sometimes. But honestly, sleep makes a huge difference in your cognitive abilities. So protect your sleep, work on your sleep hygiene, get good sleep. So how can you tell if somebody might be living with dementia? These are your measuring sticks because we all forget things. But is it something that interferes with your ability to function on a daily basis? So the person may forget things more often, they may struggle to retain new information. Changes in mood, personality, and behavior. I'm wearing a heart necklace. You might not be able to see that from the back of the room, but I trust me, there's a heart necklace. This table will vouch for me. Got a heart necklace on it. I specifically got it out of the drawer and put it on this morning because I want to talk to you about the fact, and I know I said it last time, but it should be said over and over so people take this home with them. When somebody lives with dementia, they retain the ability to feel emotion. Their own emotions remain intact. No matter what cognitive losses they are experiencing, they still feel. They will feel their own emotions. And that is huge when you want to work with somebody who is experiencing dementia. So hold on to that fact. They hold on to their feelings. They will have the ability to feel, but not the ability to control emotions the same way. So you will have somebody who could suddenly be angry or in tears or laughing inappropriately. And they don't have, they're not doing it to, uh, get attention, they're not doing it to be difficult, it's that emotion bubbles up and they don't have the same checks for it. <laughs> Talking about problems with language, so forgetting simple words, uh, using the wrong word without notice, having difficulty understanding what people are saying. I think one of the things that we could all change when we walk through those doors out of here today is make a commitment to ourselves and to others that we stop relying on pronouns and we start giving full information to people. Those living with dementia can't follow he, she, it, their, any of the pronouns. So you're talking to somebody and you say, um, Fred is going to come and change the shutters. Uh, he's going to come next week. Who's coming next week? Fred is going to change, come and change the shutters. Fred is coming next week to change the shutters. Just start being alert to how often you use a pronoun and expect somebody to know which pronoun you're referring to. Who, what, where, then, they, etc. Problems with abstract thinking. You know, some of us might do mazes for fun. We might think that's a great brain teaser, and it is. But when you live with dementia, and you don't understand the world the same way other people understand the world, it gets tricky. This usually shows up with math, can't do numbers, can't get two and two to equal four, can't manage money, don't recognize the denominations on the coins. It can also show up in, well, I just told you it was my dad's birthday, big 91st birthday today. Family's pretty excited about it. Actually, my dad is excited about it too. But many people living with dementia lose concepts like birthdays, anniversaries. These things no longer, these abstract concepts don't mean the same thing. Difficulty performing familiar tasks. It has to be something they could do before. If they could never do it, you can't measure them on it now. <laughs> but it's not fair. If it's something they always did and they're struggling with it, if I'm, I'm a baker, a decent baker, I would say. People eat my baking. They ask me to bring it again and again. So <laughs> I'm, I'm going to pat myself on the back. If I couldn't follow a recipe, 
if I turned out baking that was one bite and back on the plate, then you should be checking on me because that's something I was good at. And it's not due to a physical impairment. It's not like my wrist got hurt and I couldn't beat the batter, right? So if they can't do what they used to do and they were good at it, they also struggle with how do things work? So they pick something up. Now, I struggled with this. I actually know how a remote control works. I, I've worked them in my life before. Apparently not, but I have. But if, if these were my car keys and I picked them up and I didn't know which one was my house key and which one was my car key, and then I tried to put them in upside down into the lock, you should, you should worry when they can't use things like they used to. Misplacing things. Who has lost something in their lifetime? You're in church. Be honest here, folks. I cannot believe you have never lost anything in your entire life. We all lose things, but this is different. This is something that happens. Continue. Yeah, where are my glasses on the top of my head? It's okay, glasses don't count. But this is where you lose things in weird places. Now, if you had taken your glasses and put them in the dishwasher, then maybe I'd worry. Or if you'd taken your glasses and you'd put them in the, the laundry hamper, like somewhere bizarre, weird, strange, then, then I would worry. And it's losing things continually, continually. The last item, believe someone has taken it. This is huge. You know, I gave you the statistic, 46%, almost 50% of people don't want to say that they have dementia. They're so afraid of the stigma. But the other percentage, those are the people who don't know they have dementia. About half the people will experience a loss of insight. They literally lose knowledge of illness, anosognosia. And so they think that they're just fine. My beloved, beloved dad does not know there is a thing wrong with him. And he is the happiest camper going. People around him are kind of broken hearted. But he, he, you love him. He just counts his blessings morning till night. That's all he does. Because he doesn't know there's anything wrong. He doesn't know he can't do stuff anymore. And he's not yanking our chain. He's not fooling around with us. He honestly thinks he's a-okay 100%. And so if people think they're all right and they start putting things in strange places, who are they gonna blame? That cleaning lady stealing from me. That neighbor snuck in last night and took it from me. You, you got into my purse and you took X, Y, Z, whatever it was, right? So they blame their nearest and dearest. And that is a process of a diseased brain not having the recognition. It's a paradox. They forget that they forget. They don't know that they don't know. Hmm. Loss of initiative. This comes up in the questions uh, in a way today too. There is a part of the brain in the front lobe of the brain and when it gets damaged, people literally do not think, to speak, to take part, to act. It's as if their get up and go just got up and went. And so that in combined with, there's nothing wrong with me, why should I listen to you? Means that sometimes people don't do what they need to do or don't do what they used to do. When it's this loss of initiation, it is something that you can work with because people can be supported to do things if you can get them started, but they've lost the ability to start for themselves. Getting lost, I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time on this in a, in a little while. This is a huge issue and it's a dangerous issue. Unfortunately, people can easily, and this happens early in the process, can easily be disoriented. They can be disoriented to time, they don't know the year, the month, the date, but to place. Let's say they've been coming to this church for 19, 20, 25, 30 years. If they live with dementia, there's a chance they will get lost coming to church or going home from church. 
It's very sudden, it doesn't happen all the time, but all of a sudden they don't recognize where they are. Understanding visual spatial information. People can look clumsy. They can look like they weren't paying attention when they reach for a glass and they knock it over or the salt cellar or whatever they're reaching for. People cannot see things that are literally, and this is not a husband joke. You know, many times I say to myself, why it's on the front center shelf of the fridge, can you see it? This is literally an inability to recognize objects and to see things that are in front of you. So again, people are not trying to get extra attention by making you get up and come over, look over their shoulder and say it's there. They, they really cannot see it. They want it. People want to be independent. People want to function. They want to open the fridge and find the jug of juice or the jug of milk or whatever they're looking for in front of them. All right, moving on. So, impaired judgment. <laughs> so, there are so many ways our judgment can, can change. These are changes in judgment that have a much bigger consequence than if you pull out the wrong peg at Jenga. These are things that could damage your health, your safety, your finances. These are changes in your ability to recognize what is a safe thing to do and what the consequences are if you do or don't do something. You lose that ability. Now, I'm just looking at the time. Sorry, black hands on brown cloth, got it? <laughs> I'm gonna talk about dementia friendly later. Your clock is failing. 20 after 11. Thank you. But you know why your clock is failing? Oh. You're failing people with dementia because they use color acuity and they won't be able to pick up black on brown. Mm -hmm. So if you want somebody who lives with dementia to know what time it is, you can make it a sunshine, paint the thing yellow, have black hands on a sunny face, but people won't pick up. Right now we have, um, I was looking to see if the carpeting continued into the hallway. The reason I'm looking at that is people have changes in depth perception as well, so that if the carpeting is one color and the hallway is a dramatically different color, to them it looks like a change in depth. Won't look even, won't look flat. What I want to do is take these three pieces apart a little bit. We're going to look at three suggestions how you can enhance communication, offer appropriate help, and support people's reality. So, zap ahead, please. So let's talk about communication. Reducing distractions. You know, I had the privilege of coming a little early, and I sat here, and I had a nice, nice talk with uh, one, of, one of your members here beforehand, but there was a lot of noise, a lot of buzz in the room, because you were here with your friends, you were here with your buddies, you were getting coffee, you were saying hello, you were catching up, you were talking about the Jays game. Golly, I wanted to sweep the Yankees. We didn't do it. We were all having a different conversation about something else. And if somebody's living with dementia, and they walk into the middle of that buzz, do you know what they get? Get me out of here. Overwhelmed. They can't follow what's going on, they can't pick and choose, and they can't just say to their head, ignore it, just hear it as white noise. They can't do that. So, if you want to communicate with somebody, you have to reduce distractions. If you're at home, don't talk over the radio, don't talk over the TV. If you're out, and I, I sometimes do this when I'm doing public talks and people come up to me afterwards, I'll have to take them over to the corner and talk to them in the corner because there's too much hubbub and they can't communicate. Make eye contact. Here, that's an appropriate thing to do. We make eye contact because we want to ensure that the person, and I'm sorry you get my shoulder a lot, I'll make eye contact now, I'll make it up to you now. We want to ensure that we've engaged the person's attention. In order to communicate, people need to be two things. They need to be alert, so they have to be awake and 
They have to have attention. They have to be paying attention to you. You have to have the two A's before you can communicate. Uh, use short and simple sentences. Obviously not elder speak, not baby talk. But the best thing we can do is put one thought or one idea into a sentence at a time. Just one. Allow the person time to respond. It can take anywhere from an extra five to 10 seconds, depending on the person. They process more slowly. And we need to speak a little more slowly. And we wanna use a comfortable, warm tone of voice. Remember I said how emotion stays? What people do is they pick up on your tone of voice. And that's worth 37% of your communication. 55% is your body talk and a lousy little 7% of the words. <laughs> yeah, it's true. So offering appropriate help. Uh, the, the clerk in the bank, you know, can I help? You want to be open and friendly. And when you approach somebody, they do have visual changes. So you don't want to come up beside them. You want to come within their visual field. And peripheral vision diminishes and up-down vision diminishes. So you want to come on at about a 45 degree angle. If you're face on to somebody, it could be read as confrontational, right in front of their face. But if you're just slightly to the side, you can still make all the eye contact you need and they won't feel trapped. They can look past you if they're feeling uncomfortable. You want to ask, can I help? You need permission first, right? You don't want to just blaze in. You want to avoid making assumptions. And sometimes we do make assumptions. We're humans. It's character habit that we all have, you know, see if you can listen to what they're saying. See if you can ask a couple of questions. Let them tell you. Offering simple choices. Sometimes when we ask a big question, a big question, an open-ended question, what's your favorite food? Uh, what's your favorite song? What's your favorite hymn? Go ahead, pick one out of all the millions that you love. What's your favorite? When we ask big questions, we actually shut communication down. When we ask a big question, where do you want to go? What do you want to eat? What do you want to do? Those can often actually eliminate conversation because it's too much for a person with dementia to throw up all the possibilities, rank order all those possibilities. Remember the rank order, make a choice and spit it out to you. So often, what you might want to do is make a choice. If you're talking to somebody, you can give them a choice between would you like uh, tea or coffee? Would you like your red jacket or your blue sweater? Would you like, see if you can make choices around whatever they're talking about. It's sometimes more useful. And provide clear instructions. I don't know if any of you ever eat peanut butter crackers. Any of you think that's a decent snack? Crackers with peanut butter? Yeah. Maybe you make them for your grandkids. How many steps do you think it takes to make a peanut butter cracker? Throw your numbers out. 15. Did you say 50? 15. Oh, 15. Okay. 5, 15. No, you're pikers. It takes well over 40. Oh, Let me give you a thought process here. Because when we're helping people who live with dementia and we need to break our communication down, we often say something that we think is so simple and so easy, but it is full of steps. If you want somebody to do something, you have to break it down into steps. So you have to get the idea. You have to get off your chair. You have to find the kitchen if you're not already there. You have to wash your hands. Let's pause and wash your hands. How many steps are actually involved in washing your hands? <laughs> have you ever thought about it? 
You have to know which way or which path to turn on. You have to know where the soap is. You have to know to get your hands wet to put the soap on. You have to know how to work the blessed pump if that's the kind of soap you use. You have to wash your hands. You have to know where the towel is. You have to dry your hands. You have to be able to put the towel away before you move on. Then you're gonna find the cupboard. That is, if you know which cupboard keeps the peanut butter. Unless you have glass fronted cupboards, you have to remember where the peanut butter is. You have to open the cupboard, find the container of peanut butter. You have to pick it up. You have to take the peanut butter out of the cupboard, put it on the counter, go back, find the crackers, get the crackers, put the crackers on the counter, close the cupboard, find the silverware drawer. Which drawer has the cutlery? You get the idea, I'm not gonna take you through. But what I'm pointing out to you is something that we don't ever think about. We ask people living with dementia to do something and we think they will automatically know all the steps in the process. Supporting their reality, oh yes. When people live with dementia, their reality and your reality might not line up. And I'm here to ask you that unless somebody is in danger or doing something immoral or illegal, don't argue with them. Obviously, if they're in danger, you're gonna save them. They're doing something immoral or illegal, you have to intervene. But other than that, just take a breath. Just stop, just pause, just hear them out. Couple of reasons to do this. If you start correcting somebody and they are firmly entrenched in the belief that they have, what you do is you damage your relationship as opposed to convincing them that you are right. You never want to damage relationship. Relationship is the cornerstone of dementia care. If you argue with somebody, they will feel it. They will know the tenor of the conversation. They might not remember your words later, but they'll remember the emotion. So you trot off, you go about your life, do what you're doing, and you think I can set them straight, isn't that nice? They won't remember your correction, but next time they see you, they'll get that uneasy feeling. Hmm, that emotional memory remains. The other reason that you don't want to argue and correct somebody is if you're going to help them, they, they really have to trust you. So their dementia is a journey. It starts slow and insidious, and it moves on and it moves on and it moves on. Sometimes near the very beginning of the journey, you can help somebody come to a correct answer. But as the journey progresses, you have to really say to yourself, does it matter if I correct this? Is it really important that we put up red lights instead of blue lights? Is it really important that they remember that Harold came, but I remember that Harold didn't show up? You have to really think, is it worth the correction? So think about that. Offer reassurance always. And when I get to the questions, I'm gonna talk about how important reassurance is. One of the things that happens when people have dementia is that their, their brain is, it's in brain failure. That's really, if you wanna think of it that way, it's in brain failure. There is a disease that is affecting the brain and slowly over time, the brain cells become ill and sick and they die off. While the brain cells are being affected, also the chemicals and the hormones in the brain are being affected by this disease process. And so one of the things that occurs is people tend to be um, much more anxious, higher anxiety level, more suspicious, more paranoid. That comes part and parcel with the change in the chemicals and hormones in the brain. So offering reassurance, not something you can't do, but offering some sort of reassurance, and I'm gonna talk about that later. You are truly there to connect, not correct. Walk out with that one. That one's one we can remember. We can carry that in our heads. You're there to join their journey. And you wanna observe their actions and their body language. I just gave you the percentage, and when you think about it, 93% of communication is nonverbal. So I want you to listen with your eyes as well as your ears when you're interacting with somebody. So this is the scary, well, it's all scary. This is the part where people get lost. And I've, I've 
done the job I'm doing for 19 years now. And I worked in long-term care for decades before I came to this position. And people do get lost. And it is um, a very concerning situation. Six out of 10 people get lost at some point. And we usually say it's, it's not if, it's when. And people say to me, oh, but my mom, my dad, my cousin, my sister, my brother, whatever, they've never wandered. You never ever know when the first time is gonna be. So you've gotta be prepared. And that's why you each got an incredibly spiffy bookmark. On this incredibly spiffy bookmark, in pathetically small print, you will need a magnifying glass. I apologize, I didn't design them. They were not designed by me. But at the bottom, there's a website, and it's www.findingyourwayontario.ca. This is everything on this website, is everything you're gonna to need to know about safety for people living with dementia. So you can check that out. A person can go missing at any time, and often it's one of the first uh, warnings. About 50% of the people will either be seriously injured or it won't be a rescue, it will be a recovery mission. I've worked with the police, I've heard a lot of stories that you don't want to know about. So we want to know ahead of time, what can we do to keep people safe? If you suspect that somebody living with dementia is missing, you know, look around the house, check the bathroom, look upstairs, downstairs, but if you think they're missing, call 911. You are not wasting police time. This is, they say search is an emergency. And really the police would much rather that you call 911 and say my husband, my friend, my person with dementia is missing and find out that they've gotten back to the house by the time cops get there, then you didn't call. Because if you hesitate and you wait to see if they show up for three or four hours and then you call and say they're missing, it's very hard to find the trail. Maybe you're not worried about your person. Maybe you're out for one of your walks. I can just see this happening. There you are. You're out for one of your walks and you find somebody that you think has dementia and is lost. So here are some ideas. What might cue you? The fact that they might be dressed inappropriately. Certainly this is painfully obvious in the winter and in the summer. I had a woman and I, that I cared for and she uh, went to church every day. And in the heat of August, the dog days of August, she would wear her mink coat and her mink hat and be walking in the sunshine to go to church. And of course, she's profusely sweating and becoming behind it. Totally inappropriate, winter or summer. They're just standing still. Now, sometimes we stand still to appreciate something, but there'll be a little vibe to this standing still because they're probably standing still and doing a lot of concerned looking, not like, oh, isn't that beautiful? And you walk by and they say, what a lovely flower, eh? There's, there's a look of concern. They're looking around. They might be pacing back and forth in a small area. You can really read the facial expression or they might be repeating themselves. You stop to share the time of day and they'll repeat themselves over and over in a very short space of time. These are clues that you might be working or, or have met somebody who is struggling with dementia. If you encounter somebody who appears lost and confused, there are a few ideas. Sometimes, and I'm not asking you to run up and shove their sleeves up, but sometimes we can just see a medic alert bracelet. Are you familiar with medic alert? Probably. Some of you might wear one. If you wear a medic alert because you have angina or diabetes or COPD, whatever you have, it's probably got red ink on it. This has blue ink on it. When you get a medic alert for somebody who's living with dementia, the ink color is blue, not red. Also, not so much in Kitchener-Waterloo, certainly in Guelph and Wellington, people might wear a wristband for Project Lifesaver. You all need to go and encourage your police services here to get Project Lifesaver on this side. They might have a card with them. They might show you a card, some sort of identifier card. 
Um, and so sometimes you get clues that somebody, because they're wearing these tracking devices, they might be lost. This is the website that I uh, suggested that uh, it's on fine print in the bottom of your book, Mark. When you're out and about and you find somebody and you're concerned on their behalf, please don't be the good Samaritan that puts them in your car and offers to drive them home. Why not? You're a good person because they might not tell you where they currently live. They think they are, but they're not. Because they might misinterpret your actions at any point during the encounter. And that could be difficult. They might have a different medical condition completely and you get them in your car and then you've got a situation on your hands. Please call 911. You can offer to stay with the person uh, and they can say yes or no to that. And if they say no, say okay, but keep them in visual range. Call the police, say I'm concerned about somebody. Can you do a little wellness check? I'm down here at the corner if I don't know this city. You know, <laughs> tell, tell them where you are, but keep them within visual range. And then let the police handle it from there. But please don't put them in your car. Helping care partners. So I did want to talk a tiny bit about the church. How can the congregation members help care partners? Often people don't let you know quite how much they're struggling, but there are so many things that you can do. Driving, chores, housework. I care for three people right now. Um, and all three of them don't have driver's licenses and all three of them need to go different places, different times, different days. And believe me, people who pitch in and help because I work full time, right? So people who pitch in and do driving, huge, huge help. Checking in, just see, just be that listening ear, be that kind uh, phone call. If you leave a message on the answering machine, give them permission not to call back if they're too tired. Just say, don't, you don't have to ring me back, but I'm sending you some TLC today. I'm sending you some calm and some courage and I'm thinking about you. Just let them know you're there. If they call you back, great, but if they don't have the energy for it, don't put that pressure on them. Ask how the church can help, and we're gonna do that in the next slide. And I want you all to think about ideas that you might, you might have. It, that's a conversation for another day, because I know you want lots of time for questions, but that might be um, a study group exercise, something, something like that. I'm gonna talk about dementia-friendly design. If you are interested in getting more details about this, Gareth can just be in touch with me. I'll give you all the appropriate websites and information. But we can do a lot in our physical environment. I'm sorry I picked on your clock, but there's a prime example. Just, I hope the person who made the clock isn't sitting in the audience. <laughs> can we move on now? So these are things that you can consider. Signage and wayfinding, entrances and lighting, flooring, seating. There should be, yep, waiting areas, washrooms, background noise, I kind of mentioned that. Shiny surfaces are often very difficult for people, the glare. So if you want more details on the physical aspects, let me know, we'll send you that, we'll move ahead. <laughs> I know it doesn't look exactly like your church, best I could do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to read you a little tiny case study and I'm going to give you some things to think on and then we'll get into the Q&A. Joanne and her husband Carl, do you, I hope you do not have a couple named Joanne and Carl because I just arbitrarily picked the names. Okay, Joanne and her husband Carl are longtime active members of the congregation. But you are starting to notice that they aren't attending every week like they have for years and have not joined into events or coffee time. When Joanne and Carl do attend, Carl seems tired. During services, Joanne will sometimes yell out, Amen, when the minister is talking. And you sit close enough to hear that Joanne will try to talk to Carl during the service. One time during coffee, after the service, Joanne was found in the back room walking around. She looked frantic. And when you asked her what she was doing back there, she said she was looking for Carl. 
but you had seen Carl out talking to other congregation members at, at the table. So given a scenario like that, what do you think as members of the congregation you could do to support Joanne and Carl? I know that you probably have some very good ideas and you're probably already enacting supportive things, but I'm gonna give you a few things to think on. Obviously, rides to church might be useful and home. Don't just bring them to church and leave them here, okay? <laughs> Gotta get them there and back. Friendly visiting, and that can be with the person who has a diagnosis, with the care partner, or with both. Having one church I worked with over in Guelph, they uh, brought in a second service, a, a dementia-friendly service. It was mostly singing, it was shorter, it was um, sensory friendly, the lighting, the volume levels were all made dementia friendly. Um, have, a, have a greeter that is designed to leave their greeting spot. They are not anchored to the front door, three feet in, shaking hands. That greeter can assist people with getting to where they want to go. Sometimes one of the churches I work with, they wear uh, blue lapel pins. They're um, uh, big forget-me-not lapel pins. And they're the people who had some dementia training and you can go to if you have any questions. Um, make sure that everybody in the congregation knows that the Alzheimer's Society is here to support any sort of dementia and can give you training and education. Um, you know, be sure that not all people with dementia are over the age of 65, so please be alert to that. Um, when it comes to helping with church events or functions, what things do you think you could do to support the person living with dementia and, and the care partner? You know, if they've always been kitchen crew and now that's not working well, what jobs could they do? How can they still be involved? Um, what about assistance during church? This is something we did because I was supporting somebody in my own congregation who could not follow the bulletin and could not find any of the hymns. Uh, we changed the way we do our bulletin and we, we have two hymnals, one is red and one is blue, and they have profoundly long names. We gave up on the long names. It's in the red book, it's in the blue book. Like we just, you know, make it so it works for everybody. Um, is there a separate viewing area if they're feeling overwhelmed? Can they actually watch service from, a, I, I don't know your building, but you know, from a separate viewing area? Okay, that's really, and now we'll, we'll move on. Just some food for thought for you folks. We will thank you. You'll see that there's a code, and I bet dollars to donuts, most of you are not gonna whip your smartphones out and do the QR code. So what we've done is we've put a very brief, it really is brief, it looks long, but it's not, uh, an evaluation on your table. And before you have lunch today, please fill that in and I'll scoop them up before I go. We would appreciate that very much.